Welcome to our panel discussion this afternoon on the subject civil rights litigation as a tool for social change, Control v. Chicago Housing Authority. I'm Quinn Rollins, counsel at Lovey and Lovey, where I litigate civil rights cases around the country. Previously, I served as the inaug inaugural director of the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative for the state of Illinois and deputy chief of staff for the lieutenant governor of Illinois. Previously, I also served as a community organizer and the executive director of a nonprofit organizing residents in the Deep South to advance racial and economic opportunity for fair housing, voting rights, adequate schools, and safe neighborhoods. I am also proud to serve on the board of directors at BPI. BPI is an independent public interest law and policy center where we address compelling racial social justice issues that impact the Chicago region and the state of Illinois. Through our advocacy, we work to drive racial, social and economic justice through a focus on police accountability, reform of the criminal legal system, housing and economic and community development and education and early learning. We also have since 1970 served as counsel to a class of public housing residents seeking justice in, in Gatrol v. Chicago Housing Authority. Today's opportunity to reflect on Gatrol could come at a more important time. The U.S. Supreme Court's recent decisions in reproductive freedom, the Second Amendment, environmental protection, and the religion in the public sphere call the question, is litigation still a viable tool to promote racial, social, and economic justice? Personally, I can think of no better group than our panel today to help us navigate this challenging question and this challenging conversations. Today, we have some wonderful panelists, starting with Margot Schlanger, professor of law at the University of Michigan, who is a leading authority on civil rights issues and civil and criminal detention. She teaches constitutional law, torts, and classes relating to civil rights and to jails and prisons. She also founded and runs the Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse, which we'll hear more about today. Previously, she had been a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, and an assistant professor at Harvard University. In addition to her research and writing, Professor Slanger does substantial work in civil rights litigation and prison and immigration reform. In 2010 and 2011, she served as the presidentially appointed officer of civil rights and civil liberties at the US Department of Homeland Security, where she was the secretary's lead advisor on civil rights and, and civil liberties issues. Professor Slanger earned her JD from Yale in 1993. She then served as a law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the US Supreme Court from 1993 to 1995. From 1995 to 1998, she was a trial attorney in the US Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, where she worked to remedy civil rights abuses by prison and police departments. We also have Norinda Brown Hyatt, Professor of Law at Fordham Law School, who is an award-winning housing advocate. Professor Hyatt recently joined the Fordham faculty from Rutgers Law School, where she taught courses in property law, critical race theory, and landlord-tenant law. There, she also served as director of the Civil Rights Clinic and as an advisor to the African and Black Law Students Association and the Newark Housing Rights Coalition. Professor Hyatt has worked on the development and oversight of the Newark Anti-Eviction Project. She represented Rutgers Law earlier this year at the White House Summit on the efforts made by law schools to answer U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland's call to action to address the eviction crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Professor Hyatt's research focuses on the intersection of law and issues of race, gender, and access to housing. And she has authored numerous op-eds for and offered commentary to various news outlets. 
Previously, Professor Hyatt served as an assistant and then associate professor at the University of the District of Columbia's David Clark School of Law, where she taught critical race theory and Black Lives Matter and the law, as well as a seminar and clinic in housing. She was a co-convener of FHA at 50, renewing our commitment to housing equity, a symposium held in 2018 to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act and was able to explore the present day challenges to achieving its purpose. Professor Hyatt began her legal career in private practice at Hogan and Hartson, B.L. Piper and Booth and Tucker and worked as a trial attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, Housing and Civil Enforcement Section. During her nearly decade long tenure at the Civil Rights Division, Professor Hyatt led a case that resulted in the DOJ's first combined police practices and fair housing settle settlement. Professor Hyatt received her AB from Dartmouth College and JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. We also had Sarah Hendrickson, who became BPI's executive director in 2020. She is, a, she is a change maker, passionate about using law and policy to tackle systemic inequities. Kara's role as, as executive director and her, is her second stint at BPI. Earlier in her career, she was a Scadden Fellow at BPI with a focus on housing and education issues. Prior to becoming executive director at BPI, Kara served as the chief of the Illinois Attorney General's Public Interest Division for more than five years. In that capacity, she supervised the division with over 60 attorneys and a staff who enforce civil rights, disability rights, workplace rights, and antitrust laws. In addition to conducting investigations in cases involving the False Claims Act, consumer fraud, and energy issues. At the AG's office, Carol led a team of lawyers and staff that litigated and negotiated a wide ranging consent decree to reform the Chicago Police Department. An experienced litigator, Kara's law practice focused on constitutional and civil rights litigation for more than eight years at a few Sokol peers resident condemned. She also practiced at Massey and Gale and Kirkland and Ellis. Kara is a commissioner on the Illinois Executive Ethics Commission, which promotes ethics in Illinois public service, service and she serves on the board of the Public Interest Law Initiative and on the advisory board of the American Constitutional Society Chicago chapter. She was also a fellow in the 2014 class of Leadership Greater Chicago. Kara served as a law clerk to the Honorable Ann Claire Williams of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School and received her BA from Northwestern University. I'd like to welcome all of our esteemed panelists. So we'll jump right in. We'll use the control litigation to frame our conversation today about civil rights and housing. In this class action lawsuit, which was filed in 1966, a plaintiff class of public housing residents and applicants argued that the Chicago Housing Authority engaged in racial discrimination in public housing policy. I'm gonna ask Kara to begin by sharing with us some of the background of the control litigation. Good afternoon, Quinn. Thank you so much for those introductions, Professor Hyatt, Professor Schlanger. It's such a pleasure to be with you both this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to this engaging conversation. Uh, I will, Quinn, start us off with some background about the control litigation, uh, just to set the stage for what I know is gonna be this engaging conversation. Um, as you said, the lawsuit was filed in 1966. It is an ongoing case. It has uh, been around now for 56 years. The case was brought on behalf of a plaintiff class of Black public housing residents and applicants for Chicago Housing Authority non-elderly public housing units. We sometimes refer to these as family units. Um, just to set the stage for our audience, around this time, the time the case was filed, um, Dr. King was in Chicago leading open housing marches here. Um, that was the era in which the case was filed and it was brought to reduce 
uh, pernicious and intentional race discrimination by the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, and there was a companion case filed against uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. The allegations were twofold. First, that CHA was discriminating against black CHA families through the location of its housing where physical public housing units were being built and by its use of tenant assignment policies and practices. When the lawsuit was filed, CHA was in the midst of, and when I say CHA, I'm referring to the Chicago Housing Authority here. It was in the midst of a massive program to build thousands of public housing units and apartments. Um, but those apartments were being located almost exclusively in neighborhoods where black families were segregated in Chicago. At the same time, it was uh, building these units and these buildings, it was also secretly assigning families on the basis of race explicitly. White families were assigned to CHA's four predominantly white developments and black families were assigned to developments that were located in parts of the city, uh, which were exclusively, nearly exclusively populated by black residents. The lawsuit asserted that these actions by the Chicago Housing Authority violated the Equal Protection Clause and the Constitution's 14th Amendment. Recall this lawsuit was filed at a time before the Fair Housing Act had been passed by Congress. There was a companion case filed against HUD for knowingly funding these discriminatory activities by CHA. That case alleged a violation of the Fifth Amendment. The case was filed by Alex Polakoff, a lawyer in Chicago, and a group of his colleagues um, who were at the time volunteer ACLU attorneys. And BPI became engaged in the case in 1970 when Alex Polakoff came to BPI and brought the case with him. Uh, the case was decided by the district court here in the Northern District of Illinois in 1969 um, and upheld by the Seventh Circuit in 1971. Both of those uh, determinations found that the defendants, CHA and HUD, were indeed liable. And so promptly, the, the case really turned to remedies. What would the remedies be uh, for this, for this uh, wrongdoing? Um, at the time, there were between 25 and 30,000 uh, families living in the Chicago Housing Authority. And, the, and so the depth of the discrimination by CHA and by HUD was pretty significant. So how do we address remedies uh, in a case like this as I know something that we'll talk about today. Uh, in 1969, the district court judge, then Judge Aston, Austin issued a judgment order that required a balanced approach to public housing development. He held that going forward, in order for CHA to construct any new family public housing units in census tracts in the city of Chicago that were more than 30% African American, CHA was required to build an equal amount of family public housing first or simultaneously in other areas of the city. Also that 1969 order placed restrictions on CHA, including that it could no longer build high rise public housing for families and could not build dense concentrations of public housing in any neighborhood in the city of Chicago. The order also mandated implementation of a new non-discriminatory tenant assignment plan, which the court approved in 1970. Importantly, and I know we'll talk about this as we go on today, the remedy did not require demolition of any CHA housing, um, and no order in the Gautreaux case has done that. Instead, the remedy really focused on three streams, and I'll just summarize those briefly here. First, it focused on the creation of what was called scattered site public housing. These were smaller developments that were initially envisioned to be typically less than 30 units each. Um, all across the city of Chicago. Um, again, with the balanced approach um, that was ordered by the district court judge, and then ultimately with HUD uh, preferring and really focusing on building those scattered site units in areas of the city where public housing was not already concentrated. The scattered site program though had a very slow start and it never really achieved the hope for scale uh, when it was first designed. Um, there were several reasons for this. There were obstacles by the Chicago City Council, which refused to approve the sites for public housing in white neighborhoods. 
Um, BPI and the control lawyers uh, ultimately persuaded the district court judge to set aside a state law that gave the city council that veto power over public housing sites, but that intransigence um, took some time uh, to work through. Ultimately, because of the intransigence of CHA and obstacles with the city, um, the district court uh, implemented ultimately a receiver for the Chicago Housing Authority. This was another entity that stepped into the shoes of the Chicago Housing Authority and acted as CHA. That receiver was appointed in 1987. It was the Habitat Company. And that the Habitat Company as CHA's receiver took over the duties to implement the scattered site program beginning in 1987. However, due to the passage of time, the development of vacant land was now uh, somewhat limited uh, because development had been uh, going on during this entire period of time. And so, you know, due to those limitations and the slow start, the scattered site program developed a number of scattered site units, but it was slow to get off the ground. I'll say two more remedies and then I'll, um, and then I'll give my other panelists a chance to weigh in. The second uh, big picture remedy was uh, housing voucher mobility program. So in 1974, um, Congress enacted a new form of subsidized housing, then known as Section 8 housing. This essentially enabled um, residents of public housing to receive a voucher that they could use to uh, lease up in the private market. Those vouchers are now known as housing choice vouchers. Um, the Gatro Assisted Housing Program um, enabled the use of those vouchers for families across the entire region. So initially, the U.S. Department of Justice um, uh, and HUD fought to keep the use of those vouchers as a Gatro remedy limited to the city of Chicago. Um, but in the Gatro case, uh, plaintiff's counsel uh, argued the case to the United States Supreme Court and won metropolitan wide relief, that is the use of those vouchers outside the city of Chicago as a remedy in, in this case. Um, I know we'll talk more about that as, the, as this discussion goes on, but the use of those vouchers as uh, vehicles of authentic choice was an important remedy. And then finally, as the case proceeded in the 1990s and the HOPE 6 program uh, was created by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, the use of mixed income developments in the city of Chicago um, also implicated the Gatro order. And uh, so the massive redevelopment that's been happening in the city of Chicago since that time has all fallen under the Gatro case as well. So it's a big, long, broad case. Thank you, Kara, um, especially for painting the, the social context, whether or not it's Dr. King's involvement in Chicago, et cetera, or even the politics uh, around the scattered sites and city council. I want to move on to uh, Professor Slanger. Before I get to you, I just want to say that for our audience members, uh, we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A function um, as opposed to the chat and we'll get to as many uh, thoughtful questions as we, uh, we can. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the University of Michigan Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse in a few minutes, but the inclusion of the Gatro case represents an expansion of the scope of the collection that's been housed there. Uh, so we have Professor Slanger here today, and uh, maybe we can begin with you with you explaining why you have chosen the control case as a case to broaden these archives and what you see as significant uh, about the case from your uh, from your perch. Great. Thanks so much for having me. And, and I'm happy to take that question. So the Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse is a website that presents information about civil rights cases nationwide, focusing on injunctive cases and class actions. Um, so not so much. We have occasionally the, the, the damage action, important damage actions, but mostly not so much. And we are currently presenting over 6,000 cases. So it's a lot of stuff. And I founded the Clearinghouse about 15 years ago with an orientation towards the present. So the idea of the Clearinghouse has been, people sometimes talk about the civil rights era and the demise of civil rights litigation as an important force in American um, politics and American governance. I don't really think that's right. Um, I think civil rights litigation has been maybe a little bit domesticated, but it continues in a really important way. And so we have focused, especially on the present. 
But the cost of focusing on the present has been to omit some of the super important cases that some of them are still ongoing, but that started in the civil rights era in the past. And um, that has felt like a loss to me. And so one of the things that I've done in the past couple of years is thought about, well, what cases can really show the, how hard fought and how difficult, but how, um, how hard fought and how difficult civil rights litigation can be, but also show its capacity to actually accomplish stuff. The Gautreau litigation has been enormously important in the development of public housing, not only in Chicago, but nationwide. And so it's one of the cases that I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could include a lot of information about that? And there are other cases that are have been part of a similar project, but they're not as far along. Like, for example, I hope that we will eventually be posting something similar about Milken versus Bradley, the Detroit DSEG, um, school DSEG case, and some other ones too. But Gautreau, um, I was lucky enough to have a conversation with folks from BPI who said, yeah, we have an entirely digitized archive, and we would really be interested in putting that out there in the public, where the public can get at it and see it and use it for various purposes, for understanding the litigation, for research, for um, celebration of some of the pioneers in this area, for, for um, uh, imitation in some ways, for all kinds of different purposes. And so for, I think the first conversation was maybe two years ago, maybe longer, something about COVID makes time very hard to track. But, but we had a first conversation about that and, um, and have managed to bring it in um, to balance the clearinghouse's general orientation, which as I say, is towards the present. And I've been very, very thrilled to be a part of that and look forward to showing everybody kind of what we've done. Amazing, wonderful. Professor Hyatt, um, Gautreau was one of uh, several systemic civil rights cases that focused on race discrimination in public housing filed over the past several decades. Uh, from your vantage point, what is it that you believe we should learn from those cases? And what do you believe should be the legacy on racial equity in, in public housing today? So I take those as, as that is two, two, two questions. And um, first, I let me back up and say thank you so much to BPI for the invitation. And it's an honor to really be on this panel with um, folks who are just really at the forefront of, of public housing work and in the archive is um, you know going to play such a huge role in how um, we continue to think about this kind of litigation. Um, so to the question though, or questions that, that were just posed, um, you know, I, I think we're at a watershed moment of thinking about how we move, um, access to public housing forward, right? And so I think that we need to build on the systemic civil rights cases that have been brought. But I think we would be remiss to not learn from the current moment, including the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, what, what I see as not such a stark difference from like the civil rights movement, right? Um, so I don't wanna suggest that this is all new. I think Black Lives Matter is actually building on the civil rights movement. And um, so maybe what I'm suggesting is that um, we update our approaches uh, consistent with where we are today and learn from some of the challenges. So right, um, there have been great gains as a result of some of these cases, but I am just struck as I hear Kara, you know, just remind me of 56 years, right? Um, you know, this is, this is a whole lifetime of work. And I, I am called often in, in the last two or three years to think about whether or not work that takes whole lifetimes um, is really our most effective pathway in, in the future, right? Because what we want is that the control litigants, the families 
were to have the benefits of this systemic change so that now, I mean, that could be one to three generations of families that could need it change for whom we're still fighting, right? Um, and so I just wonder whether there's certainly a place for systemic litigation and civil rights work that is, you know, decades long, but I, I, I wonder whether um, we need these archives such as this to mind them to see how we might tweak approaches going forward that could provide relief more quickly. And so I just wanna give a couple of examples, some things I've been thinking about what happened. Another in, you know, public housing authority, I'm from Philadelphia, but I, 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 I know people in this, this community are probably familiar with Occupy PHA, even those of you not from Phil Philadelphia. So that was um, hashtag Occupy Philadelphia Housing Authority, where um, those uh, members of the housing advocacy community in Philadelphia, um, including law clinics and um, lawyers, but also homeless persons, community members, moms, children, um, you know, uh, just concerned citizens in the city um, squatted both in Logan Square Park, uh, um, a baseball field there in a very affluent neighborhood in the city, um, but also started squatting in um, boarded up homes that the public housing authority owned and had owned for a long time and um, was leaving empty despite the need for housing, right? And this is public housing, um, um, real estate. And so I just raised this as one example of how um, I see a sea change from the ground in terms of whether our clients want to wait 56 years. Uh, and so, you know, whether our clients um, when they need housing right now, when they need their public housing authority to respond right now for their children to live better right now, how might we as lawyers and advocates and community partners think about maybe bridging the gap between Occupy and a litigation like a trust? So, you know, I just, I just pose that like question back to us all. It's a powerful question. I think, um, you know, litigation should always beg the question about its relationship between grassroots groups, direct action, um, and the larger social movement that it sees itself within. And I think that's a powerful question to pose. And I um, think many organizers uh, break their teeth in, in organizing work in, through the housing space. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a very important, uh, uh, very important relationship to to continue to press on. Um, Kira, I want to bring it back to you. Um, you know, of course, we've, as we've talked about, Gautreaux has been a case that has been litigated in a particular place, Chicago, which has, uh, I think what Professor Hyatt may be alluding to in some ways, is it also has a deep, like Philly, has a deep organizing uh, space. Um, and, uh, you know, the case has been focused on a particular group of people, Black residents uh, who receive federal housing assistance, who have also organized over time. Uh, what has been the impact of litigation in Chicago? Um, and how does a case sit within the context of Chicago uh, today? Thank you. Thanks for that question. And I really, I think Professor Hyatt's um, urgency, the urgency that she brings to this conversation is, is really, um, is really a, a foil almost to what we see in the way that Gautreau and the Gautreau litigation has played out over the decades, as she points out, for 56 years um, in the city of Chicago. So as the litigation, you know, we, we, we won, uh, we found liability, um, uh, many, many, many years ago, and then the evolution of largely federal housing policy, but local housing policies as well, um, really impacted the way in which remedies were crafted over the course of the case. And so I talked a little bit about um, the scattered site, uh, you know, remedies. When we look at that today, um, you know, in all, there were about 2,000 scattered sites units built. 
um, in the city of Chicago. In Chicago, we are divided into about 77 community areas. Those are just geographic portions of the city. Um, those scatter site units were built in about 57 of the 77 Chicago community areas, and there's some of that work that is still ongoing. Um, uh, but the, the uh, creation of the voucher program in 1974 by Congress greatly impacted um, the way in which public housing resources and dollars are spent, you know, everywhere in the country, including in the city of Chicago. Um, CHA's voucher program is now more than three times the size of its public housing program. And so the existence of um, uh, uh, an ongoing mobility model in the Chicago Housing Authority that enables families to use those vouchers um, authentically to create choices across our region has been an important legacy um, of the control litigation. There are thousands of families have moved um, using that program in the, in the city of Chicago and in our region. And a very, very large influence in an impact that, uh, that shaped the relief in Gatro was the HOPE 6 program that I mentioned briefly that, that began in the 1990s and then took the form ultimately um, in the city of Chicago in the plan for transformation that was announced in 1999 by the Chicago Housing Authority. That plan included demolishing um, the, at that point, existing high-rise public housing developments and replacing them with mixed income housing. Um, this was not uh, something required or called for by the, as a remedy in the Gautreaux litigation, but because the remedial phase of the case continued to be ongoing, this, we, our class was continuing to wait for relief, the judges order limiting new construction um, in existing public housing sites was called on and, and shaped the creation of, of mixed income communities in the city of Chicago. And so a large part of the ongoing and impact of on physical buildings in public housing in the city of Chicago has been the creation of mixed income uh, communities across the city of Chicago. So. Um, the Gautreaux plaintiff class has participated through BPI and the working groups that exist in each of those, uh, in each of the working groups that relate to how uh, housing will be developed in each of those mixed income communities. So that ensures that public housing units are available in mixed income communities, that they are mixed throughout communities and are not segregated, that are repeating the mistakes of the past. Um, it, it ensures that there are sufficient numbers of public housing units in those mixed income communities. Um, and we also advocate on behalf of families who were displaced when the high rise units came down um, and ensure that those families receive services and supports that enable them to move back into the new mixed income community. So, um, you know, as we look today at public housing in Chicago, it looks significantly different than uh, public housing in 19. 66. There was no voucher program in 1966. Today, there are 47,000 uh, people in the city of, or administered by the city of Chicago who receive uh, uh, rent vouchers. Um, the physicality of the developments um, in the city looks vastly different, and that redevelopment is ongoing. That is a decades long project um, in and of itself. There are currently actually more families now receiving housing assistance, either through physical buildings or through vouchers, um, than did at the time of the initiation of the Gautreaux, um lawsuit, but it just looks, it looks very different. And so as the um, lawsuit has continued, uh, the world of public housing has, has evolved. Um, there have also been a number of changes that have come out um, in the city of Chicago and in the state of Illinois because of the litigation, most prominently the elimination of the city council's veto power over sites for public housing, which is significant, private management um, of some of the mixed income developments um, to enable these to be um, healthy and flourishing places for all families to live, um, and investment in, in the wait list for public housing developments that enables families to be housed more quickly um, when vacant units become available. So there has been a, a real transformation um, of housing as, uh, in Chicago since the case was filed. Thank you, Kira. I know, I know one of the things that gets me excited about litigation is thinking about the larger arc 
uh, in a historical context of the work. And, you know, this, I think we can all agree these injustices didn't, didn't just start today. And it's more than just looking at the case law or the statutes, but looking at other resources like, like these archives, um, et cetera, to be able to glean something different, bring a new nuance to the case. So I wanna go back to Professor Slanger um, and um, I want you to be able to talk a little bit more about the University of Michigan Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse. Um, can you talk to us about what role that clearinghouse plays in the fight for justice? Um, and can you walk us through this resource? What, how is a tool for other organizations um, and individuals who uh, are listening today? Sure, sure. But let me let me start by saying something that I think might um, for people in the audience who are not who, who have not participated in litigation like this, just to make one thing clear: when a case lasts for fifty six years, it's not like if a damage action lasts for fifty six years, where it takes you till year fifty six to get your money, right? When a case, a, an injunctive case, lasts for fifty six years. What that means is that during the pendency of that litigation, something is changing about the governance structure for the institutions affected by that litigation. So it's a new kind of oversight or a new source of influence or a new set of regulations that then stay in place during the pendency of the litigation. And when the litigation goes away, might go away. So um, uh, in injunctive litigation, sometimes the fact that a case lasts a very long time can be a sign that it is being very effective as opposed to a sign that it is not being very effective because it's, a, it, it's got delay. I don't mean that it's always like that. And I hear Professor Hayat's point very urgently, litigation is slow, but it's not 56 years slow. It's not, it's not like, I don't know, Bleak House or whatever that Dickens novel is about the litigation that goes on for generations. It's, um, I think that um, when, Gatro goes away, and when other litigations like it go away, sometimes we see some retrogression on the part of superintended institutions. And that's one of the reasons why the clearinghouse is important, because it shows people kind of what is currently in place so that they know what they need politically to organize for if that litigation-driven um, governance structure withers. So, so that's part of the point of the clearinghouse. I see that Professor Hyatt turned off her, turned yeah, off. Yeah, I just, I want to. Before I get to this next thing, which you asked me about, I, I don't want to, I don't want to. I just, I want to just inter interject that I think we, we have to consider, and you know, I've done litigation and, and large scale litigation. And so I, I just want to make sure that it's clear that I don't think there's no point of litigation sure. that, um, we should also think about whether it, it is the most effective tool. So when I hear Kara talk about all the things that were gained in control, my mind has to think that we really needed our government to be able to do that without people having to keep suing and keep looking. This is not that these this arc is wrong, that the results are wrong, but the, there's a tension in litigation and uncertainty in litigation that I think calls for us to consider whether this is a public policy, uh, it, whether we need to achieve our best public policy for housing through large scale systemic litigation in last decades, or whether in the future, there might be other ways and whether government shouldn't be proactively responding to the needs of their people, whether the public housing authority should be proactively responding to the needs of their people in all the ways that Kara is talking about without the uncertainty cost in length of litigation, right? Yeah. So that's all I raised. Yep. I think we probably whether, agree. I think, whether, I think we, yeah. Not that there is, you know, obviously we bow down to control and all these other systemic litigation litigations, but I think it is worth us all thinking about whether this is the way forward for the future, not whether it was the path for the past, right? So, so let, me, um, let me use that as one of the aspirations. Let me explain that that is one of the aspirations of the Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse. So here's, here's the Clearinghouse. Um, this is a website, as I say, that I founded about 15 years ago and that we just did a big reboot of. So the way that it's set up, um, this is the front page, uh, we post 
you know, we feature cases here. Here's Gautreau. Um, we feature cases in the top and there's a, it's all searchable in um, below that where the idea of it is to make available to the public, to um, uh, the polity, to politicians, to policymakers, to researchers, information about both current and past cases so that they can think about whether um, they can think, use them as you know, what lawyers call go-bys if they're bringing their own lawsuit, but also so they can think about whether maybe they should be go-bys for people who are doing non-litigation policy change. What can we learn from litigation um, to do without the litigation? So that's the basic idea. And um, uh, as I say, we're posting uh, 98, um, 9,800 cases. Um, I actually, some of those are in process. There's, that's why I came up with the number 6,000 before, about, about 6,000 of them are fully coded. And we post all kinds of information and it's all searchable by various things. So for example, we could search for cases that involve like Gautreau court ordered receiverships. And we could find those and there are 25 of them in here. Um, court ordered receiverships are quite rare. They're commonest in the District of Columbia where the federal courts don't care about the autonomy of the place that they sit in. Um, they're a little bit, a little bit heard of in public housing cases. And after that, they're, they're, they're very, very rare. But in any event, it's all searchable and available. And if you look at any given case record, and here I'm going into Gautreau itself, what you'll see is that we've got a case summary, generally speaking, written by my law students, although this one I, I wrote some of. Um, but mostly it's written by my law students. And this, this is no exception. This is a very long summary because it's such a long case, but mostly there are a few pages. It's got then some information about who was involved and then it's got all kinds of documents from the case, um, which are available for anybody who wants them. It also has related resources. These are articles about Gautreau. Um, for example, here is a, um, a book, Waiting for Gautreau by Alex Polkoff, who Kara talked about, who was the um, lead counsel for so long. And then this one has a very special um, uh, resource, which is a Google Drive. Let me, sorry, I didn't click effectively. A Google Drive, which is the entire litigation record of the, um, of the entire litigation. And so here is every document in the case organized by date. Um, we don't do that for most cases, but we're gonna do it for a couple. I hope to do it for Milliken, as I said, we're doing that for Gautreau, we'll do it for a few more. But every case in the clearinghouse has the basic structure, this is just a random one, for example, the basic structure that I talked about, every case has a case summary, has documents, um, and has uh, what resources we are able to put together. And we did put together one special resource for Gautreau just because of this event, really, and I wanted to show it off, which is a timeline that runs through the kind of crucial moments in the litigation. Um, and that will um, be displayed on the case page too um, fairly soon. So, and we'll, and we'll do these for a couple of other of the most historically significant cases. So that's what we do on the Clearinghouse. I'm gonna stop sharing screens and just talk for two minutes about why we do that. Um, the reason why we do that is because um, litigation is, one tool for justice that only one tool, there are lots of other tools for justice, legislation, um, agitation, organizing, um, private, private nonprofits. There's lots of tools for justice, but litigation is one of them that is, has been very important and that is very document-based. And so it's possible to capture what litigation accomplishes and what it does by way of a document archive, and then to make those documents available to people who can use them to either imitate them in litigation or imitate them in um, non-litigation advocacy efforts. The documents themselves are not merely of historical uh, interest, although I think they are of historical interest, 
but are also of a going forward kind of prospective interest. How should I manage that? So just for example, not to do with Gatro, but another big project that we did at the clearinghouse that actually became public last week was we looked at 75 cases involving deaf and hard of hearing and blind and low vision prisoners, took all of the settlements in all those cases, compiled them into best practices and published a document of recommended policy modifications based on all that litigation and made it into a report that's available on the clearinghouse. Somebody could do that as well and have has done it actually, not with us, but in other ways, in terms of these housing mobility kinds of interventions to compress that into best practices, publish it and make it available for people to do without litigation. And the point of the clearinghouse is in, in it's not the only thing that we're doing, but it in large part, that's what we hope to achieve across a, a huge variety of civil rights topics. I, one final word and then I'll subside um, is that how important litigation is and how available these other kinds of methods are really varies a lot with the topic. So um, uh, for prisoners' rights, which is my own specialty, litigation has been particularly important because prisoners are locked away, um, disabled from many sources of advocacy and deprived of the right to vote, certainly while they're in prison and in many states after they get out. And so some of the other avenues of um, achieving justice are closed to them, which makes litigation loom a little bit larger and makes the litigated reform all the more important. But that's not true of every area in the, in the civil rights litigation clearinghouse. But we have tried to cover many, many, many areas. And as you could see, are posting um, information about you know between six and 10,000 cases, depending on how you count. Um, and I hope that it is a really valuable archive for a lot of people. We get about, oh, um, between five and 10,000 visitors a, a week um, who, who at least land there for a minute. A lot, some of them stay, some of them quickly leave, um, but five and 10,000 visitors a week um, are, use, use the clearinghouse. Um, so I hope that, that that's useful. And um, it's certainly been, it's been kind of a labor of love for me for the past 15 years. So, um, so I'm really pleased to be showing it to this group. Thank you, that's amazing. Um, I wanna ask one more question before we move to Q&A. And uh, Dr. Hyatt, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask a two for again. Um, the, I guess, um, <clears throat> One question is how have your students been responding to in this post George Floyd era around uh, their belief about the limits or the opportunities and challenges of these traditional uh, litigation tools? And then the second one is I think you've written uh, you know somewhat extensively about how social justice lawyers need to expand their view of fair housing. Um, and think more about equitable development. I think you use a term called the problem of urban uh, decolonization. Uh, can you just share for our audience what that means um, and what you think the civil rights community needs to be doing to, to deal with urban uh, colonization? Right, um, so I'll start with the second part of your question. And the, the thought here, again, if we think about time, right? Um, the Black community has, and, and not to essentialize, but there's a great deal written on how the Black community itself thinks about integration. And so the case that you re refer to in um, your introductory introduction that I worked on, um, very heavily focused on what happens to Black and Brown people once they are integrated into communities, especially those communities that don't want them. And so I think we have to recognize that we've learned a lot over the course of the last few decades, um, we have learned a lot, the Black community has learned a lot about um, integration and what the costs are to them individually. And I, I, I would say, um, I, I wanna just refer to Professor Derek Bell's work too, in thinking about just in a different context, in the school's context, 
whether what Black people, even in, in seeking integration in the first place, were, were looking for proximity to white communities or whether they were looking for their own communities to have resources. And thinking that in the absence of getting resources in their own communities, the next best thing was to integrate with white community, right? And then you've seen that happen over time and that there are repercussions that, you know, that, that could have been foreshadowed, that there would be repercussions to trying to integrate black and brown people into white communities, right? So what urban decolonization tries to think about is, is the only way to achieve higher educational status, better job jobs, more access to transportation, get out of food deserts, proximity to white communities, some of which that are hostile to the black and brown residents that are, are, are moving um, into, into those communities, or might we demand um, more fully that resources, and there are people doing this work, right? This is, not none of this do I think of as like either or. I think of it as and, 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 <laughs> right? So that there needs to be litigation, legislation, agitation, as um, um, has, has been already noted, on the, on the point of bringing resources into the communities where black and brown people already exist and that there's something there already, that there's something valuable in being in community with people who wanna live next door to you, who wanna take care of your kids, who wanna look after them, who don't wanna call the cops, like who, who wanna you know, be teachers and in, 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 in church members with alongside of each other. And, and I think that what was lost in some of the work of Scattersight and even vouchers is um, this ability for black and brown people to have community with themselves that is supportive and healthy and positive, not toxic and traumatic. Um, and so I think we have to lift that up and name it. I wanna say, I've been looking a lot to Lonnie Grenier's work on constantly being the minority. And what we get out of, you know, scatter sight and vouchers, I spend a lot of time with vouchers, like advocating for people to be able to move wherever they want. And so, you know, this is very complicated, but what we get is a constant minority status that constantly diminishes the things that people who are black and brown with these vouchers value, and they're always up against a majority. And so there's been challenge there. What do you do when you can never create a solid majority that believes, again, without totally essentializing, but may be more aligned in terms of what they want from public officials, governments, and even their own housing authority? Um, I would say that students are, again, in the streets, like what happened two years ago when school was shut, but you could go in the street and protest, that they have a duality, right, that I certainly didn't have when I was in law school. I was totally focused on the system as it is and litigating and, you know, pressuring legislatures. And I think our students now have a duality, which is to say they understand the value of those traditional tools in our tools box, but, you know, also thinking about Audre Lorde, can you dismantle uh, with the, the masters, uh, uh, can you, I'm, I'm botching it now, but um, can you dismantle the master's house with the master's tools? And I think our students are, are working with the duality of saying like those tools are important, but they may be the master's tools and we, we there may be other tools that we also need. And so I learn a lot from them, right? Um, I was trained in a very conservative space we're using conservative tools, but I learn a lot from community partners and, and our students who are, I think, see things maybe a, a different way than us. And, and I think we're going to be better for having a broader sense of how we move forward. I think this dovetails nicely into um, one of the questions we have from our audience. And I think people are thinking about how they step into the breach of the law, especially with the recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions. The question says, litigation means to me accountability. The other pathways speak to responsibility. How do we identify a path forward if litigation is not solely it? That's our purpose. I mean, every, every path has pluses and minuses. Every path um, uses different parts of the community and different and and um different talents and different um uh different structures and i i'm i'm very much in the both and category um I, 
always. And I think that that these days you're not a very good public interest lawyer if you're trying to do if you're if you're trying to get compensation for your client. That's a very different kind of a project. It might further a, a broadly applicable project in a way that's really important, but it's it's a specific goal. If you're trying to change an institution and that's what you're litigating for, you're not a very good lawyer if you're not thinking of always how that interacts with people using other tools, legislation, protest, um, uh, various kinds of public pressure. And if you're not thinking not only how it interacts with them, but how it can make them work better. So I don't think it's a, how do you pick? I think um, it's the rare public movement that doesn't fire on all cylinders. I'll briefly add if I can, um, just to, to lift up again, the and and approach. Um, Gitro right now is in a settlement agreement phase. Our work day to day focuses not only on um, some of the voucher and mobility work we talked about, but deep investment in, in Chicago in the south and west sides where mixed income communities are, are being developed. And the point about you know, demanding more of, uh, of our governments in provision for housing in the Chicago area um, and more broadly national, I think is a really important one. And so I would just wanna echo the and and approach. So it's litigation, it's organizing and it's fighting for tools in both of those areas and in other areas um, that address so many, so many broad needs. Hard to hide any thoughts. Not doctor. I just want to say thank you for offering that extra title, but I haven't earned it. So <laughs> just mm -hmm. Narenza, please. Absolutely. Thank you, Quinn. Um, no, I think everything, I agree. I echo what has already been said. So um, with that, I will um, turn on my organizing hat for a second and just say that, you know, I think many communities are trying to figure out these complex nuances around the law. Um, but before my time in uh, litigation, I was an organizer and the organizer in me would say that this, this isn't just, we aren't just talking about housing problems or public housing problems or eviction problems or segregation problems. We're talking about power problems at the root. That's, that's what communities are struggling with. And uh, power means to be able to. And they're trying to figure out how they live the life they want to live um, and deal with these nuances, I think, as Dr. Hyde expressed in terms of what does that mean we can have resources where we are, or does that mean we have to deal with alternative B? Um, or as Dr. Slanger is discussing, how do we get access and resources to a prisoner who's trying to figure out the context of their case um, in nuanced ways um, when their library is, is not functioning? Um, so, um, I, but I think that the, the root of this conversation is how we take these lessons about how folks have tried to deal with that power problem and use these lessons moving forward uh, for folks who are still trying to grapple with the way their lives look and what fair housing um, and accessible housing um, and affordable housing looks like. I want to say thank you to our panelists today. I want to say thank you to BPI uh, for hosting us um, and to CARA for continuing to lead and shepherd this institution. Uh, to do legal change work in a way uh, where we are uh, not only in the in the spirit of practice, but also thinking about um, being conscious and responsible about the theories that we move forward with. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, everyone. Have a good evening.